Hey everyone and welcome back to another audio only edition of the Roundup, our Tuesday and Friday gaming news show. Of course, I'm at Gamescom, but we will be back to normal pretty darn soon. Let's just get right into today's stories. First up, Xbox. So, amidst Xbox's new strategy of garnering good favor amongst gamers, well, Vice have revealed some of their prior sins. As recently reported, Microsoft had contractors reviewing audio from Skype translations and Cortana on Windows. Now, the fact they review audio that is outlined in their privacy policy, although the disclaimer that humans do some of it, that is a recent addition. Regardless of the policy, this is completely against what many people would consider appropriate, though. Now, as I'm sure you'll remember from the release of the Xbox One, consumers were quite worried about privacy because the Kinect came built into all of the consoles. It was like the only way to purchase it. Now, as it turns out, people were right to be concerned. In addition to other Microsoft products, a portion of Xbox One voice recordings were given to contractors to manually transcribe and feed into their machine learning systems. Most of these audio recordings were intended for the Kinect to hear, following genuine Xbox commands, but not all of them. One contractor told Vice that most of what they were called transcribing were unintentional activations, with players trying to dismiss Cortana once she responded while they were, you know, trying to play. Another contractor said that most of the audio that they heard was children speaking, and that they found it quite wholesome, with children giving, you know, amusing and innocent comments like, Xbox gave me all the games for free. So even if that only happened because of unintentional activations, it's obviously not an ideal situation. Now, this data is supposedly anonymized, but in general, this is a significant problem across tech. In Microsoft's case, they claim to have stopped reviewing Xbox audio manually as of a few months ago, saying they no longer believe it is necessary, except for cases in which voice messages are reported uh, for abuse. Now, by most standards, it does seem like they kept the user information safe, but the fact that humans were reviewing and transcribing clearly acts accidental Cortana and Xbox triggers is definitely worrying for a lot of users. And as I said, it is concerning that this is, well, quite a problem across tech. That said, it is reassuring that as the tech industry is getting hammered for this, they do appear to be making concessions, but it should serve as a stern reminder that understanding and, uh, you know, recording your behavior, that is very valuable to companies. If there's a microphone in the room, well, don't say anything you wouldn't want somebody else to hear. While that might seem quite paranoid in a less personally paranoid version of that, data is a massive part of how the industry works now, and, you know, nearly every company in tech wants as much of that data as is possible. There's an argument to be made for data genuinely improving systems, but there should be the potential for users to opt out, or even make the process opt in in the first place. That's not all for the Xbox news, though, as some have reported on their statement that they have no future plans to bring Xbox exclusives to the Switch or PS4. They still believe in cross-play and flexibility for developers, but when it comes to their first party, they still want to draw people to the Xbox brand, and they will use first-party exclusives to do so once current commitments are met. Some responded to the news as if they'd gone back in some of their promises of freedom, but I think in the rush of the news, the distinction of exclusives exclusive first parties kind of got lost. Microsoft's head of gaming services, Ben Decker, has since told Game Reactor that they would like to see Game Pass on all platforms and that that is one of their long-term goals. Game Pass would still have people on the Xbox platform, but the core of Game Pass is largely comprised of third-party games, and if your business is games, then getting them in the hands of many people is a good idea. So that's overall Microsoft's opinion. We are seeing simultaneously a more open approach, but also them continuing with first-party exclusives. And then moving over to Team Blue, we see more or less the same thing with Sony's Sean Layden speaking to Bloomberg on their recent acquisition of Insomniac. During this, he said that while exclusives are still part of their strategy, some games might see other platform releases. More narrowly, he said this, we must support the PlayStation platform. That is non-negotiable. That said, you will see in the future some titles which may need to lean into a wider install base. So realistically, this does make complete sense. With high quality for first party titles, you want to give people reasons to pick up your console. But given the qualifier that some games may basically just need more players because of how they work, I imagine Sony could have a few decently large multiplayer titles in the works. Now as for branching out platform wise, they've already begun. While it's not a first party game, Sony Interactive Entertainment are publishing Robot Entertainment's Ready Set Heroes on both the PS4 and the Epic Games Store. While the choice of store is certainly not going to be popular with a lot of PC gamers, it does 
show that Sony are well aware that there is a market segment left for them and they seemingly are moving with it. This also follows on from reports of Sony's strategy back in July, which basically they, they said they were prioritizing AAA games and reading in between the lines, it sort of seemed like this gen, indies did not have a ton of impact on their console sales. If I had to guess, I'd say the players on multiple platforms simply purchase wherever they play the most, and it would take a swath of really high-quality indie titles to actually get somebody to purchase into a platform like, say, a PlayStation. Really, for them, the trick is to use first-party things like Death Stranding or Spider-Man to really get players to pick up a console. Then next, Steam China has been expanded upon with Perfect World and Valve giving a presentation in Shanghai covering their progress. They're getting closer to launching, with 40 games being approved so far, although there's basically no details about how Steam China itself is really going to work and what it could support. While one would imagine that getting Steam officially in China would do wonders for the platform, the truth of the matter is that Steam China should terrify some developers. That might seem weird, but regular Steam, the one that we know and love, that works just fine in China as is. In fact, Steam is one of the better ways to get access to games that haven't been approved by the Chinese government, and that's how millions of Chinese users actually use that platform. Once the official version goes through though, and the government is able to, well, you know, to keep an eye on it, it's quite likely that Steam's unregulated version will be banned in China, and while that may be good news to some players who uh, don't appreciate Chinese players in their multiplayer games, plenty of developers could take a very large sales hit there. The Chinese market currently is quite large on Steam, and their approval process is strict, arduous, and very time-consuming, so, so if this happens, those users would be walled off from a lot of developers who couldn't get through that system, and China would be in full control over what game content that the Chinese users get access to. This isn't just a problem for Chinese players and Western developers, though. They may also be sort of pressured to make changes in the platform to conform to, you know, what the party sort of says uh, relating to their approval process. Now, sure, they could create a unique build for China, but let's put it this way. If you were making a game and you knew you could grow your audience 30% by emitting some skeletons or excluding a racy scene, then financially you'd be a fool not to consider China in your game's design from day one. And I think that's where we're going to start getting into a little bit of a culture clash. Then next up, it's time to talk about numbers. Superdata's monthly report is out, and this time it's quite interesting. While mobile growing 14% drove a 5% increase in total spending, up to a whopping 9 billion, both PC and console spending has declined. In particular, console has seen a drop in free-to-play spending of around 50%. I'm not really sure what's driving this drop, but uh, hey, it's likely a positive if consumers are starting to rebel against, uh, you know, the practices of free-to-play that a lot of us don't really like that much. Speaking of which, Superdata has, surprise, surprise, had GTA in the number one spot for a console. Apparently, GTA's casino update earned about 69 million, and it's one of the game's strongest months since launch. They also estimate that Apex Legends uh, season generated double June spending throughout July, but it's still around half of what their season one update made in March. Things, yeah, they're not really going that well for Respawn, not as well as they would like in a number of fronts, and I don't envy their position now. It's going to be very hard to compete with the content update cadence of Fortnite. Now, as for another Battle Royale, PUBG got itself a price cut, and it sold another 1.1 million units at around $18. Certainly interesting for a game that has been out of the headlines for some time, but it has been keeping up a very strong pace in terms of continued sales, even if it is under the radar for many at this stage. There seemingly still is a market left, and uh, yeah, they want PUBG and its promising updates. Then over on the Switch side, Fire Emblem Three Houses has sold over 800,000 digital units in July, making it the strongest digital launch for the franchise. But of course, that's not too surprising. The 3DS was not exactly the prime system for digital sales. Overall, Fire Emblem is proving to be an absolutely huge player for Nintendo, and between Three Houses strong sales and the, well, its potential to draw eyeballs to the series, well, all it really takes is for those players to then download Fire Emblem Heroes for that to cascade for Nintendo. Gacha games can take even the most resilient of souls and get them, uh, well, invest in the franchise enough and get a lot of their money. And then let's round it off with some quick fires. So, MMO games usually rely on random gear drops to stop a deterministic path to completion 
position and, you know, increase player time and all of that stuff. Well, Fallout 76, like with most of the negative aspects of MMOs, has tried to take this to the extreme. This was likely a bug, but upon finishing the game's new Vault 94 raid, a player got screwed, their allies each received three-star legendaries, but all they got was a drill. Uh, not some rare endgame version of a drill, no, just a regular common drill. Uh, the best part? The user called it the Rod of Howard and sold it for 10,000 caps and uh, ended up with uh, quite a nice little story. But once again, this is just a story of Fallout 76 has QA issues and it has bugs. Then next up, we've got some potential leaks about the Apple Arcade. So this premium service, which should allow people to have access to the best mobile games on the Apple platform, if their marketing is to be believed, may cost as little as $5 a month, according to some details that were found in Apple's API as reported by 9to5Mac. We're likely to hear more about this at Apple's 10th of September event, but if their initial claims of 100 high quality games at launch are accurate, and it is only that price, it actually actually could be quite a good deal. There's a lot of really good quality, non-free-to-play, non-microtransaction, you know, really artistically strong games uh, on iPads and iPhone, and it would be nice to see those be more supported. Then there's also a small but important update on the Riot game situation. So, that class action lawsuit that we covered a few weeks ago accusing them of gender discrimination and violating the California Equal Pay Act, well, that has been settled. In a blog post, Riot said that these issues are not systemic, but they found that some experiences that people had didn't live up to their, quote, values or culture, and essentially, yeah, they settled it out of court. It's a really a tacit admission of guilt whenever a settlement like that happens, but it's the kind of thing where they'd rather just clean the story up quick quickly and, uh, well, be over it. We'll have to see how that goes. Of course, Riot has a lot of issues. They've made a lot of big commitments, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more to say on this story in the coming weeks. And then finally, after some time in the works, Minecraft will officially support ray tracing. It's a very interesting one. Digital Foundry got hands on with a Gamescom build that supported Nvidia's RTX ray tracing, and I don't think words do it justice. Like, just look at the video. I've linked it below. It's really quite beautiful. Minecraft, I think, with that really simple art style, lends itself quite well to high quality lighting as we've seen with some of the really impressive community shader packs. And uh, yeah, this is just us seeing that officially with ray tracing and all that that brings. So there you go, that's it for today's episode of The Roundup. We will be back to normal with this show very shortly indeed. I've got to go though because the hotel checkout is in five minutes and it would be pretty awkward if we got charged for an extra day. So thank you very much for watching this video and with that, I'll see you next time.